All right, well, I had a, a lot of times the title ends up being just a direct quote or a term from the Bible. And so I had down for the title, For Conscience Sake. That's actually a phrase that comes up several times in the Bible, For Conscience Sake, doing something for conscience sake. And hopefully that'll be explained in the message if you don't understand what I mean there. But I think I, at the last minute, I just thought, well, the title probably should be something more like Your Conscience and the conscience of another, your conscience and, uh, and another's conscience, okay? Because this is what we're talking about, every man's uh, conscience and it being a clear conscience before God. That's the, that's the subject, that's the idea of what I want to talk about this afternoon. And we think about what is a conscience? Uh, I like to study words, and the, my favorite way to study a word as far as when we're looking at the biblical definition of a word is not to go to a lexicon or go back to Greek or Hebrew and see what that word meant. You know, I'm not saying it's always wrong to do that, but uh, my favorite thing to do is just look at all the times in the Bible where we find that English word in the King James Bible and look at the context and, and get an idea about how the word is used. That usually explains it pretty well. Like this morning in Sunday school uh, in Iola, we did a word, I, 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 a lot of times in Sunday school we go through a word and it kind of got filled in the blank and we do a word study and the word there was convert, okay? So we just look through every time. Now, I don't always go through every everyone because that, sometimes that's a lot of passages, but in this case, it was pretty much every time the Bible used the word convert or converteth or converting and something like that. And we were able to look at all those different things and find out what does convert mean? Uh, you know, some people will say, well, it's this experience where somebody, you know, comes to, to a faith or, or they get saved or, you know, people will use that word different ways. Well, actually, the word just means that they did a, a turnabout. They were going one direction and they converted. They're very similar to the word repent. In fact, in Acts, it says repent and be, and, and, and be converted. And if you think about what it's saying, it's just saying, hey, you were going one direction. Now you're going the other direction. And you have to look at the context of the Bible to see, you know, in what and in, in what way, what did they repent from, you know, or, or you know. Anyway, you guys uh, are on track with that. But the cool thing is just to be able to go through the Bible and look at that and say, the Bible pretty much defines itself. You know, you can, you can figure out what the Bible is trying to say. But what, another thing I do since we're dealing with English is I do like to go to the etymology of the word and see where did we get that, that original word. That usually helps you know the definition. And so conscience comes from two words, con and science. Con can mean lots of things. It doesn't mean like a con man. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, con and science means simply together with knowledge. Together with knowledge. And if you look up, uh, you know, maybe some ideas about what that could mean as far as the definition and the etymology of the word, you know, it's kind of like uh, having knowledge with somebody else, which seems kind of weird. What is, con you know, what is your conscience? Because that's what we normally think about conscience is that small voice, that inner voice or whatever, right? Well, if you think about it, you kind of you kind of have knowledge, you know, with yourself. <laughs> you know, you have this understanding uh, of yourself. Have you ever uh, seen in the, the cartoons, you know, or movies? They'll have like this little small man sitting on your shoulder, and maybe it's sometimes it's like an angel on one side and a devil on the other side, which is kind of silly, but. And these things are whispering in his ear. And one's telling, you know, do that. And the other one's saying, oh, you know, you shouldn't do that. And a lot of times people say, well, that's your conscience, you know, or uh, uh, alter ego is, is in, in the, the theory, you know, psychological theory or whatever. A lot of times people talk about that small voice, you know, the inner voice, uh, somebody uh, on your shoulder talking to you, uh, the alter ego or super ego. And, uh, and we, we, hear these this word used a lot in our society about that about our conscience you know let your conscience be your guide you've heard that or uh, just follow your conscience you know that's not always great advice you know but sometimes that's the best that you have to go off of whatever so let me give you real quick this is introduction but i want to give you some thoughts from the bible about this con this idea of conscience and then we'll get to the the message okay so romans 9 to start with romans chapter 9 I'm just give you a few thoughts as you study this word and concept in the Bible. Here are some things that we learn. Number one, our conscience is not the Holy Spirit. Okay, some people say, oh yeah, you know that small voice you've got inside you? That's the Holy Spirit. You better obey that. Well, not necessarily. <laughs> you know, that small voice could be doing telling you to do something that is not right at all. And you say, Well, my heart just tells me to do that. That inner voice, that that con my conscience says I should do this. You know, well, that might not be good enough. 
And listen, you can't always blame that on the Holy Spirit, okay? However, the Holy Spirit can speak to your conscience and remind you, for instance, the, you know, well, the Bible says I shouldn't do this. And the Holy Spirit speak to your conscience. Your conscience, that, that, that small voice inside, if you want to call it that, tells you, hey, you shouldn't be doing that. And it, and it kind of uh, speaks to you. But it's not the Holy Spirit. So Romans chapter 9, verse 1 says, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. Okay, So it's like the Holy Ghost is speaking to my conscience. And my conscience is telling me what's right or what's wrong. That's the way that it works. Look at John chapter 8. The second thing, uh, by way of introduction, our conscience causes us to be convic uh, convicted. You say, I have a conviction. I'm convicted about a certain thing in my life or uh, that I shouldn't be doing something. And there's this, this conviction. Some people would say, that that is your, your conscience. No, but the conscience can cause you to be convicted. All right. John 8, 9. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. Background here was that the woman was supposedly caught in the act of adultery. They brought him before Jesus and Jesus said, hey, uh, let he who is guilty, I mean, he who is uh, without sin cast the first stone. And so it says that they were convicted, right? So what does that mean? Did they have a, just a spiritual, you know, revelation and became believers from that day and never sinned again after that? No, there's no reason to believe that, okay? But what it means is their conscience said to them, hey, what we're doing is wrong. And they dropped their stones and they walked off. So he said, uh, what, was the, what was the word again? Uh, verse 9, let me see. It says, they were convicted by their own conscience. Okay, so that's not necessarily even the Holy Spirit. But the idea is that there was something inside them that said, that's not right. And they were convicted. And the point that I just want to make there is that people can have a conviction or realize that something's wrong and not even be saved. They, they might not even be Christians. Uh, a Muslim could have a conviction about something and think what they're doing is right based on their conviction, you know, of what their inner person, their conscience is telling them uh, to do. <clears throat> Turn to Acts chapter 23. So as a Christian, the next point I want to make, and this is just looking at this word throughout the Bible, as a Christian, having a good conscience before God or sometimes it said having a clear conscience means that there's no conviction inside you that tells you that what you're doing is going against God on a particular matter. Now, that certainly doesn't mean that you're, when you say I have a clear conscience that you're without sin, we all know that we have sin. First uh, John says, if we, you know, say we have no sin, we're liars. I was just talking this morning about that verse, how it says we, right? And John is, is, is talking about, He's talking to believers, and then he's saying, if we say we have no sin, we're liars, right? He's saying we all have sin. We all sin regularly. Now, it's not good. We shouldn't sin, uh, but we all, we all sin. So having a clear conscience doesn't mean you think that you're without sin. It just means if I'm getting ready to do a particular thing, and I'm like, I want to do what's right before God, and uh, so you search yourself, you search the Scripture, you think about it, and then you say, you know what? My conscience is clear. I'm, I have a clear conscience before God. I can do this thing, and I don't feel like I'm going against Him. This is what we're talking about. So Acts chapter 23, verse 1. And Paul, earnestly beholding the council, said, Men and brother, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. He doesn't mean that he's without sin. In fact, he thinks of himself as the chiefest of sinners, and he thinks back to some bad things that he did in his life. But he's saying, you know, in the steps that I'm taking... I'm living in a clear conscience before God. I'm trying to do what's right. Look at uh, chapter 24, verse 16, page over. Chapter 24, verse 16. And herein do I exercise myself. He's saying, this is what I, this is what I give myself to in discipline. This is what I'm exercising myself to, to always, to have always conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. He's saying, I don't want there to be anything in me that says, you know you shouldn't have done that. 
you know, you sin before God. You know you shouldn't have done that. You sin to that, uh, with that person. You sin against that person. I, he said, my mission, the goal, but what I want to do is live my life having a clear conscience before God and a clear conscience before man. Without, uh, without what was the word that I used? Of? What passage was it? Let me see here. 24, 16. Uh, I want to make sure I get it right because I always misquote it. Uh, it says, conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. All right, last of all, uh, for introduction, here's something I want you to consider. Knowledge plays a big part in the development of our conscience. Knowledge plays a big part. So here's what I mean by that. If a person is never taught that something is wrong, they, their conscience doesn't, isn't necessarily going to convict them. I remember talking to a guy uh, that I worked with years ago uh, about the subject of pornography. Certain pr people in our church had fallen, and, and then we talked about how, you know, we're men, and we fight certain desires and everything, and, and I was talking about my past, and, and the subject of pornography came up, and the guy said, I don't have a problem with it. And I was like, well, man, you're a better man than most because some have a real problem. He's like, no. I don't have a problem with it. Like, I don't think anything's wrong with it, <laughs> which I don't believe. I think that he actually does. He was just trying to pretend like he didn't. But the fact is, if somebody was taught that it was right their whole life, nothing wrong with it. Nobody was ever t told them that it was wrong. It was sin against their own body, sin against God, sin against their future spouse or something like that. Of course, their conscience isn't going to be convicting them like somebody who was taught from day one. Hey, that's wrong. Don't do that. You know, quit looking at that. Hey, I mean, our kids... Uh, most Christian kids are the same way. You're watching something on TV, right? And you're like, oh, guys, turn your head. Or, you know, <laughs> a billboard when you're driving by. You know, this is, this is just how you do. And so somebody who, who grows up in that lifestyle, they tend to have more of a conviction uh, because of their conscience inside them saying, hey, that's wrong. That's wrong. And other people have never been taught that. You say, uh, so I remember talking to... Uh, debating back and forth with some atheists. They didn't believe in God, and they said, uh, because one of the arguments a lot of times Christians will use is like, well, how would you even know what's right and what's wrong if there wasn't a God? Now, that's a long story, and we could go, go down that, that rabbit trail, but the argument that a lot of them make is, well, we, our morals aren't based on the Bible or Christian principles, and they say, look, I don't believe in God, but I still have moral ethics. I still have moral code. There's still things that I think are right and, there, and things that I think are wrong. And I've always thought it was interesting because usually if they tell you what they think is right and what's wrong, a lot of times it's based on biblical principles. Don't right. steal, don't commit adultery, all these kind of things, don't murder. But where did they get those? Well, probably they were raised to believe those were wrong. Maybe their parents had Christian influence on their life, you know. Or maybe their grandparents or whatever. So it just got passed down and passed down. And somewhere in their upbringing they were taught, hey, you need to share. You know, or, hey, you don't need to do that. Hey, don't, don't fight. Hey, don't hit. Hey, don't say those words. And they're saying all these kinds of things. And so whether they're atheists or not, when they grow up, there's something inside them because they were taught and they know what's right and what's wrong. So, so when it comes to our conscience, a lot of, uh, of how much our conscience speaks to us and convicts us of right and wrong has to do with our education. Right. So... One thing we have to remember is that not everybody has the same level of education when it comes to biblical things, the way of God. Some people don't know. They don't understand. Or maybe they have a conviction that something is wrong, and you're just like, that's silly, you know, because the Bible says this or that. Hey, that's their conscience. They don't know. They're not educated yet. They don't have knowledge of that. And so let me show you that by looking at Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. And all these points will probably come up a little bit in the, the main points of the message. Romans chapter 2, verse 12. For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For... When the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having no law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, 
in their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. Okay, so you say, well, the, in that day, you know, the Gentiles didn't know much about the, uh, the laws that the Jewish families had been raised on. And it's like, well, how do they know what's right and what's wrong? Well, some things were written in their heart. You know, some things they just knew that they weren't supposed to do this or whatever. But in the context, he's talking about, hey, we have the law. And so we've been living by the law and being judged according to the law. And, uh, and if you think about that, then obviously, you know, you know what's right and you know what's, what's wrong, which is why in some ways the Jews were judged a lot more harshly because they knew better. They had the Old Testament scriptures. They, had, they should have had knowledge about Christ coming and all. Whereas it seems like God was super merciful to some of the Gentiles that didn't know these things. You know, and this is why, yeah, if to whom much is given, much shall be required. If you grew up in a Christian home, you grew up with Bible teaching and all these principles, there's going to be a little bit more required of you because you should have something inside you saying, I know better. I know that that's wrong. And, uh, and I know what's right and what's wrong. Okay. So the idea of follow your conscience or let your conscience be your guide is pretty dangerous, you know, because we don't know that our conscience is even always right. But what we want to find out are what are some steps that we can take towards making a decision with a clear conscience. I know that I have a clear conscience before God whenever I do this. And uh, here are some different steps about that. Okay, number one, as I kind of already pointed out, we need, to, uh, we need to have knowledge on the situation. We need to gain knowledge about a matter. So go back to 1 Corinthians 8. First Corinthians chapter eight. He says, now as touching things offered unto idols, apparently the church of Corinth had, had either written a letter or somebody had, had went and talked to Paul and said, yeah, the church of Corinth, they have these questions. And one of the questions that came up is, hey, should we eat, you know, meat that's been sacrificed to idols? Is there anything wrong with that or whatever? And, and however they asked the question, I don't know, but his response was, the following. Okay, he says, now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. And I'll, uh, I'll explain that a little bit more here in a minute. Look at verse 4. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things which are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know, see that word, know, it's, it's knowledge. We have knowledge. We have understanding that an idol is nothing in this world. And that there is none other God but one. For though there be, uh, be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we in him, and, uh, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and, uh, and we by him. Okay, so here's what he's saying, that we uh, have knowledge about these sacrifices that are offered unto idols, we're like, you know what? There aren't any other gods. It's not like there was some kind of mystic blessing or curse upon this idol. You know, we used to live in uh, Japan when I was growing up. And uh, if I had to do it again, I, you know, I wouldn't want any kind of an idol in my house, okay? <laughs> but we had a, a happy God. Some people call it Buddha, but really it was just a happy God. Bald man, fat belly. Uh, sitting there and uh, probably like this, I can't remember. And, you know, there were some like superstitious, like if you rub the head, it's going to bring you good luck or all these kinds of things. The Japanese have all kinds of weird superstitions. On, New Year, on, on their New Year's, they would put like these, these beans in the, throughout the house and they would, you know, ask the spirits to bless the house or whatever. And we, we got saved, we all got saved in Japan, uh, mil, uh, ministry to the military on base there. And we went to this church, we got saved. And so later on, we kind of laughed at some of those practices as we saw them doing that. And we knew in our head, even though we had that little happy God there, which again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that, but that's another story. <clears throat> but in our head, we're just like, that's not a God. It doesn't do anything. Now, if something happened in the house, uh, you know, uh, early on before we were Christians, let's say something would fall off the table that the happy God was on. We might say like, oh, what is, is that a coincidence or was that God, you know, like upset or something like that, you know, and, and people that are unsaved sometimes will think some weird things like that, okay? But once you're saved and you understand, hey, there's only one God, Amen. then all of a sudden you're just like, that doesn't really mean anything. Now there's still, 
it's, it's, God still doesn't want you to make graven images and, and put them where you're going to bow down to them or pray to them or anything like that. Uh, that's a subject for another day. But, uh, but the idea is we understand as Christians, and that's silly. That's nothing. That doesn't mean anything to me. It's not going to hurt that, uh, to have that in my house. Uh, uh, if somebody said, hey, we prayed uh, to Buddha. I don't even think they pray to Buddha, but anyway, we, we, you know, whatever. Uh, and, and so here have this gift. It's been blessed by, we know in our head, it's not been anything. If somebody gets out a voodoo doll, you, are you, everybody know what a voodoo doll is? Uh, and they, they put a pin in it or something like that. And it's supposed to be attached to a person. So if they put a pin in it, then you can feel that in your shoulder or wherever, wherever, or wherever they pray. Obviously I'm not worried about that. I don't believe in that. Uh, I remember I worked with this guy from Kenya. Uh, I don't remember what tribe he was from. I think Maasai tribe or something like that. And he had come to the United States for a long time. And he had super long fingernails. And I said, man, why do you have such long fingernails? And he's like, oh, I hate cutting my fingernails. He said, because somebody can get your fingernail clippings if you clip them and they can put a curse on you. And, uh, and, and you know, so he, he lives his life with all these superstitious beliefs. And as a Christian, you're just like, that's silly. No, 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 it's true. You're almost like, well, here, take one of my fingernails and try it. <laughs> it's not going to work, right? But to them, it, it, it is. And so knowledge is super important. And if you want to know what makes God happy and have a clean, clear conscience before God, we have to gain uh, knowledge. Not everybody has that knowledge, though. Look at verse 7. How be it, there is not in every man that knowledge. For some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. So now let's say you got a young believer, just new convert, you know, to Christ and uh, still trying to understand some things. You know, you've talked to new believers. They still don't. Twice yesterday when we went out soul winning, we've met people who seem to have a salvation testimony, but there were some things they didn't understand. Maybe eternal security. Uh, they didn't completely understand that. Like I, you know, you can kind of hear sometimes they're like, well, I don't think so because it's, you know, it's just the gift of God and it's not by works, but, but you can tell by different preaching and confusing, you know, that they, they just don't totally get it. So you can see somebody who's lived in a, a world of uh, idolatry and people worshiping these other gods, and maybe they turn their heart to God and said, I received Jesus Christ you know, we don't know because we don't live in that culture, but probably there was still some attachments to, you know, having something that was blessed by uh, God or they prayed over this or, or they sacrificed it to a God. And so they feel like if I'm eating this, right, I'm actually eating this unto that idol. And Paul's saying, we know better. We, we understand that I don't care what they did. They prayed over that. They blessed that, you know, uh, I don't know. I, I heard somewhere that uh, I can't remember if it was Muslims or Jews or what, but there was some some organization that made uh, they sold food. I think it was, and they prayed over it or something before they sold it. I can't remember the whole story, but you know, somebody might say, "Look, I'm never ordering something from them because they, you know, prayed to Muhammad or <laughs> to Allah or whatever." And, uh, and, you know, there's a lot of different weird stuff out there, but we're like, you know what? I don't really care. None of that means anything. So we have that knowledge, but not everybody has that knowledge is, is, is the point here. Look at uh, Acts chapter 3. Even uh, the Apostle Paul, we're going to see here in a second, even the Apostle Paul did some things before he got saved that he thought was right, but he was ignorant about it. Acts chapter 3, verse 14. Uh, oops, I'm in the wrong place. Acts 3, verse 14. Uh, okay, and here he's talking to the Jews here, and he's preaching to me. He says, But ye denied the Holy One and the just, and desired a murderer to be granted to you. Remember, they said, Give us Barabbas. And they wanted Jesus to be crucified, and they wanted a murderer to be set free. And they said, uh, he said, uh, and killed the prince of life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Uh, yea, the faith which is, uh, which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I wot that through ignorance ye did it. 
as did also your rulers. So he's saying, even those people that put Jesus on the cross, some of those, they were just doing that in ignorance. You know, this is why Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Okay, now look at Acts uh, chapter, no, no, 1 Timothy. Go to 1 Timothy. And this is the verse I was talking, to, talking about uh, regarding the Apostle Paul. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Even the Apostle Paul, when he was crucifying, I mean, he was persecuting Christians and he was going after them and he was doing all this. He's like, you know what? I did it ignorantly. You know, he probably had a conscience inside him saying, hey, those guys are going against Judaism. You need to go persecute them, right? And it was only later, whenever he, was, he had heard the preaching, I believe preaching of, of uh, Stephen was a big influencer there, influ influential moment where he heard that preaching. And then later on, he's on, uh, you know, he gets a vision from God and saying, why prickest thou against the pricks? I mean, why kickest thou against the pricks? And I think the Holy Spirit was beginning to work upon that conscience. And he learned something now that he didn't know before. And he's like, whoa, this Jesus Christ is true. And, and so he couldn't resist that anymore. Does that make sense? But before, he still had a conscience, but his conscience was telling him to do wrong. And he thought that it was, was the right thing to do. Okay, so some people don't have the knowledge, and so therefore their conscience can be wrong. It can tell them to do the wrong things. Now, a weakened conscience is different than what we would call a uh, seared conscience, okay? Now, if you don't understand something, your conscience might be weak. But if your conscience is seared, that's a different story. Look at 1 Timothy, you're already there. You're already there for, look at chapter 4. Let me see, should I start? Let's start with the first verse. Chapter 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. And what that, I believe, means is that conscience inside them is telling them what's right, and they're resisting it and resisting it and resisting it until their heart is hardened, and it's like being seared with a hot iron. It's become calloused, and it's become... The uh, only thing I can think of in my head on seared is like if you take a piece of meat that's raw, and you sear it. I don't even know if that's the right definition, but you know how it has that like hardened part now? and uh, Or you cauterize... Uh, you know, somebody's blood vessel is, is, is uh, 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 or their veins are bleeding or whatever. The doctor will cauterize it. I think that's kind of the same idea. So here's you got this heart of flesh and now it's seared as with a hot iron. And, uh, and, and they have actually resisted the Holy Spirit and their conscience has been seared. OK, that's a different story. But someone who just doesn't have the knowledge yet. Hey, they need to hear, the, they need to hear, let's say it's the gospel, right? They don't have a knowledge of the gospel, so they don't understand. Their conscience is telling something else. We have to be patient with them and make sure that they get the gospel so that they can know the truth. And so then their conscience can be awakened in that way. Uh, but, or it's somebody who is a new believer, but they've heard so much false teaching their whole life. They don't know their, their conscience is weak and we need to teach them these things and be patient with them because uh, they haven't learned all these things. And not having that knowledge causes a weakened uh, conscience. Okay, number two. So the first step is to gain knowledge about a matter. If you, wanna, if you, want, to, if you want to live with a clear conscience before God, you're going to have to study the Bible because you're going to have to know this is what God says. And so therefore... The more you learn about the Bible, the more you're like, hey, I got a clear conscience before God. I'm following this. I know what's right. I know what's wrong. My conscience tells me, you know, oh, yeah, doesn't the Bible say such and such? You know, I had uh, I had two people last week or maybe the week before. Uh, two people came to me and asked me about divorce and remarriage. And, you know, both of them are, you know, are, are learning the Bible and they've applied themselves and they're studying the Bible. And they said, I want to ask you a question. And it's basically like, but I think I know the right answer. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, I remember when uh, uh, Brother Jeff, you know, first started coming in Iola, and he started going soul winning and all this. And he's, and that's how he, that's how we did a lot of discipleship. He was like, I was reading in the Bible, 
And I got a question for you, but I think I know the right answer. And he would proceed then to tell me what he learned through the Bible. And I'm like, yeah, what you read in the Bible is right. I think you ought to do that. <laughs> it's pretty easy to counsel somebody who's actually in the Bible and they're learning and growing. Uh, and it's kind of like discipling themselves in a way. And so, uh, uh, so anyway, we, uh, we need to gain knowledge on a matter. Okay, but number two, this is important, all right? and this is why we even gained the knowledge to begin with, we need to decide to love the Lord and to love others, not just, not just our own selves. Okay, because sometimes, uh, you know, let's, let me, uh, you, you realize this, that a reprobate, I mean, somebody, let's say, let's say a psychopath or a sociopath, I don't know what the difference is. Somebody has like no, it seems like they have no conscience, right? But do you understand that they will still learn the law, for instance, and they'll say, well, if I do that, I'm going to get caught by the law. And so there's something inside them that says, well, don't do that or you're going to get in trouble. And so they will like skirt around that and figure out a way to do something else because it's really they love themselves. It's like they don't really care about the law. They don't care who they're hurting. They just don't want to get caught or whatever. So even a reprobate, you know, can get around the system or, or, or something like that and fool everybody. But the reason that we are concerned about having a clear conscience, the reason we want to know what's right and wrong is why? Because we love God Amen. and we love people. Amen. And if you love people and you love God, you're going to want to know what's right. Okay, that's why we would even want to get the knowledge of those things to begin with. So back to our text, 1 Corinthians 8. <clears throat> Look at uh, verse 1 through 3. Now, as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. You see right there, he's saying that when we have knowledge, for instance, not, um, okay, he's saying when you have knowledge, knowledge puffeth up, right? Knowledge can make you pri 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 prideful or proud. <laughs> knowledge can make you proud. And you're just so glad that you have this knowledge and you're so much better than everybody else and, and, and all this kind of stuff. So we have to be really careful about that. But we need to realize that we don't know everything perfectly. So everything that we want to learn or we're trying to grow or, or we need to know, uh, you know, what's right, what's wrong, is all based on the fact that we love the Lord and we love people, which means it's, that's going to be the opposite of, pri of pride and we're going to humble ourselves and we're going to want to learn. What does God want? What do we need to do to be right with people and to be pleasing to God? So we need to decide to love the Lord and to love others. Pride will just cause us to make decisions contrary to our conscience and, uh, and, and to just do our own thing. <clears throat> Look at Romans chapter 13. Romans 13. We want to obey not only so we don't get caught and don't get in trouble, like I was talking about the reprobate. Uh, we want to obey so our conscience is clear before God. Okay, so Romans chapter 13 verse 1 talks about this. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whatsoever, whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Uh, do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is a minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is a minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Now, I'm not going to preach on this chapter. There's a whole lot I could say about that. But look at verse 5. This is where I'm headed. Wherefore, ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath but also for conscience sake. All right. So it's not only are we worried about the wrath, you know, not only because uh, let's be honest, I don't see anything wrong with me not wearing a seatbelt. 
But if I get pulled over, it's like, I got to, I don't want to get, I don't want to have to pay a ticket. So I'm putting my seatbelt on because it's the wrath. Okay. But when we obey the laws of God, right. And yes, there are some little tied into obeying the laws of man, but let's forget that for a second. Okay. When we obey the laws of God, it's not just because of wrath. We don't want to get in trouble, but it's because our conscience, we want to have a clear conscience. Why? Because we love God. And so we want to do what's right. And so, uh, uh, so decide to love the Lord and others. Gain knowledge about the matter. These are, these are steps to live with a pure conscience before God. Number three, in love, if you do love, if you do love the Lord, if you do love other people, in love, our clear conscience will be concerned about the conscience of others. Okay, now these, that might sound like, uh, a strange thing to say, but go back to our text. So because I love God and I love others, I recognize that my conscience is my conscience. Somebody else's conscience is their conscience. All right. I can't expect them to feel the same way about everything as I do. Right. In, uh, in Christian circles and uh, independent fundamental Baptist churches, no doubt is no exception. We tend to think, sometimes that our convictions are right and that everybody else ought to do exactly what we do, right? And we got to be very careful about that and make sure that we are just sticking as close as we can to what God says. And we have a clear conscience before God based on what our conscience says and knows to, to be right and wrong. But we have to understand that not everybody else is going to have that exact same conscience uh, and understanding that we do. And here's what he says in uh, verse 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 8. But meat commendeth us not to God, neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. He says it's just meat. Who cares? Right? It's just food. You want to eat? Eat. If it's been sacrificed, uh, you know, it doesn't change anything about the nutritional value of the food. Okay, verse 9. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if any man see thee, which hath knowledge, sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? So now you've caused this person who thinks, man, I should stay away from that. That's been sacrificed unto idols, right? I, you know, that's, that's wicked. And then he sees you, Who's like, I don't, that's stu stupid. It's not right or wrong. It's just meat. And he sees you eat that. But remember, he still has his conscience. He still has his conviction. And so he sees you. And it could be that he says, huh, he's doing it. And he kind of goes against his conscience and kind of does that. And now he has actually done wrong by his own conscience. You know what I'm saying? He feels like he just sinned against God, which is going to probably embolden him to do more things contrary to God and to get that kind of conscience seared, right? Because he's no longer, you know, who cares? You just do whatever you want to do at that point. All right. So we have to be careful not to be a stumbling block. We need to consider the conscience of others, not only if they are Christians, obviously we don't want, we got to be careful with, with new believers and the different ideas and understandings they have and, and be patient with them and teach them the Bible and teach them what we know and, but also with the world and people who aren't saved, uh, we've got to be super careful because remember, they have a conscience too. They have an understanding. They have some different convictions as well. And our goal is to reach them. Okay, so look at 1 Corinthians 10. This is, remember, just a couple chapters later from where our text is. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 23. Remember what he said, don't use your liberty, right, to be a stumbling block to others. And here's what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23. All things are lawful for me. You know, let me just, sorry, if, if, it, if that doesn't mean anything else, here's what we know. As a Christian, born again, you know you have salvation. You know you're sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. You know you can do anything and you're not going to lose your salvation, right? This is what me messes with some people. What? Are you just trying to say we should just continue in sin? Well, no. The Bible actually specifically says that you're not supposed to continue in sin. But we understand in our, in our heart, 
I'm saved. I'm a child of God. If I go out and commit some kind of sin, I'm still going to heaven. That's pretty liberating if you think about it, right? That's pretty, that's, that's a lot of liberty because theoretically I can go out and kill somebody and it doesn't mean anything to my, to my salvation. We've said that at doors before and people are like shocked to hear that. What was it, Brother Austin? The lady said, this guy just said you can kill somebody and still go to heaven. And they sat down and listened to him. We'll hear you more on this matter. <laughs> But here's what he says, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Let no man seek his own. Here's the key. But every man another's wealth. Whatsoever is sold in the shambles. Had to look this up to make sure I was right, but shamble is just an old word for basically the slaughterhouse where they make the meat. Okay, uh, Whatever is sold in shambles. That eat, asking no question for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast and ye be disposed to go, whatsoever set before you eat, asking no questions for conscience sake. But if any man say unto you, this is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake that showed it and for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other, for why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? For if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of uh, for that, which, uh, that for which I give thanks? Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Give none offense neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Even if, as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. And this is the same thing Paul said in chapter 8. He's saying that his desire is to make sure that other people are reached for the Lord. That sinners are converted from the error of their ways. That lost people are converted to salvation through Jesus Christ. And he said, I want my life, even though I have all this liberty... You know, I want my life to have a clear conscience before God and a clear conscience before man. And, uh, and I want to make sure that I'm doing right. Titus uh, 1.15 says, Unto the pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. And we want to make sure that we are doing right for our own conscience before God and that we're concerned about the conscience of others as well and uh, bringing them to, uh, to the Lord. So <clears throat> recap real fast. So we need to live with a clear conscience before God. That should be our goal. We need to, uh, in order to do that, we need to grow in knowledge of His Word, grow in love for Him, grow in love for others. I mean, these all go hand in hand. Loving the Lord, you know, the second is likened to, to that, love thy neighbor as thyself. And, uh, and so the, in order to have a clear conscience before God, we need to grow in knowledge and in love for others. And as we grow in faith and in knowledge of God's word, we begin truly wanting to please God and to serve others. And our conscience becomes more concerned about the conscience of others. Certainly don't want to be a stumbling block to those with a weak conscience. And we certainly don't want to cause non-believers to remain unsaved. And so this is the point of a Christian dealing with their conscience and conviction and how to do this. At some point, as you grow and mature, you realize there's a lot of things out there that aren't really that big of deals. <laughs> okay, so then it becomes being the mature person and saying, well, how do I use my liberty to be a blessing to others and to serve God in a greater way? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Uh, thank you, Lord, that you do provide us with, a con uh, with convictions more importantly, that you provide the Holy Spirit and your word uh, to help us to know how to have a clear conscience before you. And, uh, and I pray that you'll help us not to use our liberality to be a stumbling block to somebody else, uh, but that we would be concerned most with pleasing you and, and also with serving others. And I pray that you'll help us to do that, that we might bear much fruit for your honor uh, and glory, and that uh, we would see soul saved and lives changed as they begin to understand your word and walk in it. Lord, we love you and uh, give you thanks for this day and for all that you've given us. Pray you, uh, you help us as we go our separate ways. 
and safety and travel and all that. And then those soul winning to this afternoon, Lord, I pray you bless that. Give them boldness to preach your word and open hearts and minds uh, to receive your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.